uh, I think that the next speaker is there. I have seen him. So he should now share his screen. So we, we, the next talk will, will be by Guillaume Boisseau, who will speak about string diagrams for optics. And I think he has his talk and he will. Yes. yes. Hello. Can you guys hear me? Uh, Can you hear me? Yes, well, I hear you. <laughs> Good. That's, that's important. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, shall I start? Yes, thank you. Yes. Cool. Thank you yes. very much. So, okay. Good. So, thank you very much for having me. And today I'm going to talk to you about string diagrams for optics. And I'm going to explain optics as well. Um, I'm going to try for this talk not to be too technical, but there will be technical bits in the middle. So um, let me start with lenses. I'm going to explain what they are. So they're, they're the hot stuff. Um, you've probably heard about lenses in recent years. At least I have heard of them everywhere. I'm going to explain rapidly what they are and generalize a bit to what we call optics. And then we can talk about diagrams with these things. So lenses come from a very simple idea. It's the idea that a getter and a setter come together. Um, so they come in pairs. And in, in this example I have on the screen, um, I have an enemy in some game that has a position. And in some OOP lingo, I have a getter that retrieves the position and a setter that updates the position. And the idea of lenses is simply putting those two together in a record. And I can do that, that's easy. And it gets interesting when I have multiple of those things. For example, here I have another one where I retrieve the X coordinate from um, a 3D position and I can combine those two. And that's, that's where I get inserting and that's where it's useful to have the two together because if we had just put on its own, we couldn't compose things, but now we can. And now we get a getter and a setter pair for the X coordinate of the enemy. And now we can you know, translate the enemy through space. So um, this record, I'm going to give it a name. I'm going to call it a lens. I'm going to call that a lens. Um, and this is what it looks like. It's simply the generic version of what we had. And now our two um, getters and setter pairs are our lenses. And I can define this um, compose map completely generically and then reuse it. And that's the point of lenses. It's um, there's reusable combinators to build accessors from small accessors to get bigger accessors. And those are used for real. There's um, whole libraries in particular in Haskell, but in other languages too, that gives you those, those particular lenses, help you construct new lenses with combinators and also gives you more general things than lenses. And that's what I'm going to present next. But first let me motivate a bit why I want string diagrams for lenses, even though string diagrams are always nice. In this particular case, if we look at compose and we try to imagine how we, go, how we would write the composed put, it's not quite straightforward because the types don't match as we want. But if we draw a diagram, then it gets legible. So if I draw this diagram, then we can see that this, the, the put sort of takes an input from the X and the other one, we can see that the, the first get is, is some, somehow useful here. And the question is, can we, can we make those diagrams formal? Can we make sense of what I've written here in a way that helps us reason about those things? The answer, of course, is yes. But let me first um, paint a more general picture of what lenses do. So um, lenses form a category, as you would expect from the type of compose we had. Um, we have a, a position and identity that's clear enough. And it works for any Cartesian category C, so it's general enough. But let me, I want to emphasize what it is that lenses do. And for that, I need this different representation for them. So on the left, I have the simple thing, which is pairs of you know, two morphisms. And on the right, I've got this new thing. There's this integral sign here that denotes a co-end. And it's, it's a particular universal construction that's very useful in category theory in general. But in this particular case, it should be read as something like existential quantification. 
and in particular, it's mere existence. So there exists a C, but I don't have access to it. And for this C, I have a pair of morphisms that go back and forth between C, between S and C cos A. And the fact that C is hidden, it's what's interesting here, because you can see, I mean, there's, there's, there's no C in, in, in the put get version. There's this C that appears here, but it's hidden. I can't access it. And essentially, whatever I do to this C doesn't change what lens I get. And this is how you should read the sort of the equation here, if you want to read it. It says, well, whatever I do to C, as long as I only touch C, it gives me the same lens. And the reason this is interesting is because now we can, I mean, to start with, this is more symmetrical, and that's already a, a, nice, a nice point. But then we can see this C cross A here, we can read it as a container, something that contains one A, and then you know, something else. But um, what if, for example, imagine the enemy has a name, and then we can have a lens that retrieves the name. But what if the name is optional, right? So this, this would be here the enemy, and this would be, for example, a string to denote the name. But if the name is missing, then I can't define this morphism. I can't define this get morphism because this one should give me a name always. So maybe I can ask a different question. What if instead of having a container of exactly one A, I said, well, can I express a container of zero or one A's? And we can, we absolutely can. Here's, here's the way we can do it. Um, the second line here, we could say, for example, where either I get an A and some leftover stuff, or I get something that doesn't even contain an A. And they're all quantified away by this existential thing. So we can't, they're similarly hidden. And this gives me a good notion of kind of like a lens, but I'm allowed to, to fail. I'm allowed to say, well, actually this S doesn't contain an A. And then we can generalize this. There's lots of different shapes we can invent. So here, here's another one here is saying, well, it could be multiple A's. What if there's multiple A's? For example, if I have a list of things, a list of enemies or whatever. And, um, and, and we can carry on. So all those shapes are, um, have, the, have the property that we can nest them. And so we get this similar kind of composition thing um, we had with lenses, but we get different shapes and that means we get, um, it, it's used for different, um, for example, for different data types. And this is what optics are. It's the simple idea of saying, well, let's generalize something that looks like lenses to different containers. Um, now it's going to get a bit more technical. The way we, def we formalize this is by choosing a particular um, category of containers and because we want nesting so if I have you know a container of A's so say in this case you know exactly one A and then you know another container of those things then exact something that contains exactly one A and then A contains exactly one X well you know you can collapse those and I contain exactly one the outside thing contains exactly one X so this nesting is very important and this is the monodal structure here and the way it's used is I have a monodal action on C. So this is, you know, this container of A, that's how you should read this, this M acting on A. And this is enough. So this is um, reasonably powerful. So this is used, as I mentioned, in Haskell and other, um, other libraries to define data accessors for data. Um, as a, the, all the shapes I mentioned are of this, of this um, type. But it's also been used in different uh, contexts that were more, more or less unexpected. Um, I'm going to mention two. The first one is open games. So um, Jules Hedges and other people have been working on compositional foundations for game theory. And in doing so, encountered and um, needed as a basic structure something that essentially was bent. And turned out that when they want to generalize to probabilistic play, what they needed was an optic. That was the right notion they needed to describe their thing, and that was surprising. The other one is um, in separation logic. Um, okay, I'm going, I don't want to get her name wrong. Um, Sarah Rovner Friedman recently gave a talk about separation logic um, that uses optics. And in here, so this is the this is the talk. And in there, what she she uses optics for is that in separation logic, you've got this idea of propositions that talk about memory locations. And here, this sort of container or the context thing is about memory locations, is you know, having access to more memory locations. And, and, and it's apparently reasonably fundamental to what separation logic is about. 
Um, and that was also a surprise. So this level of generality is not excessive, it's actually useful. Uh, let me go one tiny step further. It turns out it's very useful to allow here, maybe I can, it, to allow to change types. So maybe if I put a B back instead of an A, then I get something else back and that, that's fine. And we can recover the simpler case as, as a special case. And that also means that I don't need the two categories to be the same. And this is what we call mixed optics. And that's the general case I'm going to be working with today. So um, that's how it works. This is the sort of formula. Here you can see the container thing, monoidal thing is quotiented away and that gives me a category. So the objects are pairs and the morphisms are those things. So once again, the lenses are a special case, for example, where here the, the action will be the Cartesian product. And then we actually have M and C are the same category acting on itself. Um, and the question remains, can we draw diagrams for those? And that's an even bigger question because you know, lenses were simple enough, but that's more general. The answer is still yes. So the state of the art of diagrams for lenses and stuff like that is um, mostly that there have been informal diagrams. I'm looking like those are two examples from, from published papers. Uh, with one exception, which is Jules Hedges, actually two exceptions. Um, one exception is Jules Hedges' um, calculus for open games that has a, spe has a special case works for lenses, but optics don't have enough structure to, for that to work in general. And the other, um, the other state of the art thing is more recent, so it's not actually in this slide, it's um, Mario Roman's open diagrams for via Cohen calculus, which um, is a quite a different approach than the one I'm taking, but also works and uh, can be used to describe optics. Um, and it's quite powerful, I recommend you look into it um, if you like Cohen's at all. But I'm going to present my, my version of it, which has interesting properties. So now we go to the more technical part of the talk, which is I'm going to present a particular by category that happens to have nice string diagrams. I'm gonna give some examples of what kind of string diagrams we can do in it, and then apply it to drawing optics. And at the end, if I have time, I'll show a few examples of what we can do in that category. And the category I'm interested in, and my favorite category like these days, is pre-sheaves on optic. So if I take pre-sheaves, um, what are those? What's, what's a pre-sheave? Well, it's a functor from op, you know, optic, up to set, which means it's got an object um, mapping and an arrow mapping. So the object mapping takes, you know, pairs of objects and gives me a set and the arrow mapping has this shape. The first thing I can deduce, and I'm not gonna show you here, is that um, this actually extends to a profunder. So that it actually works on the morphisms as well. And then I can try to expand what, what this is. So I can expand what this is. I'm going to go through it quickly. You can see the proofs in the paper. Um, here, there's a, you can, there's a Yoneda lemma you can apply here twice to reduce this to this. And what we get is a way to present those pre-sheaves is Profunctus P with some extra structure here. And this extra structure is very akin to what a strength would be for a normal functor, except here it's more general. Um, but it works similarly. So it's, sort of, it's some compatibility of the profunctor with um, our sort of monoidal context. Uh, if you want to read it, so if, if you're familiar with profunctors seen as heteromorphisms, then the, the idea is that I can take a heteromorphism here and sort of map it into my container. So it's, it's kind of intuitive in that sense. And um, this is very akin to prof. So this, this, those are actually profunctors with some more structure. In terms of that, um, the, the the, we know that prof is a nice place to do category theory in, uh, in particular string diagrams. And to that, that Tambar modules, which are those perfunctors with some extra action structure, are a nice place to do category theory for category with an action on them. So we call those M categories. So we fix M that acts on C, and that's an act degree, which is not a very convenient word to say. But then we get, you know, we get something like prof. And I'm going to, I'm going to show uh, similar string diagrams as well. And so let's go into those diagrams. What can we do with it? Well, so TAM is a bi category. Um, this is TAM CD is the particular is the home category between C and D. Um, 
and it's got string diagrams like any back category does. Um, it's exactly, the string diagrams are exactly like um, string diagrams for monodal categories. So you will not be surprised by what you see. The only difference is that now regions of the plane uh, have colors in some sense. So if I have P, so here P is a, is, is a Tambara module from C to D, then I'll draw it as a wire as I would for an object in the monodal category, but there's also types. Um, so I can only, you, know, you should imagine those types as being you know, the, the color of the area. So if I want to go, if I have a morphism from P to Q, like it only makes sense to have such a morphisms if such a morphism if the colors match. So you can see I need C here and D here to match. That's the only sort of constraint. Apart from that, it really looks like um, one of the categories I and mean, normal string diagrams. So they're not actually omitted. It's just that I didn't do the, the planar region in PEC. But I'm going to draw them. Um, okay, and then we can just suppose. So again, we need types to match here, here as well. And we can do the same things we do with string diagrams. Okay, so far so good. What is interesting in this category? Well, the first thing that's interesting is there's a particular functor R, which given an object in C gives me, um, gives me a wire, so a pro functor in tan. I'm going to introduce special notation for this one because it's a very important functor. And so given an X, I'm gonna draw X with a whitewood and pointing wire to denote this particular functor R of X. And it's actually functorial in X, which means given any morphism in C, I can draw and can draw this morphism um, on the oriented wires like that. Um, this respects composition, and this is actually fully faithful. And that's quite an interesting property because that, that means I can already draw all the morphisms in C. I have them in my string diagram. Uh, your, your, your screen has gone away. Has it? No, 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 no. Maybe, maybe it's me. Sorry, it's me. Is it you? <laughs> my, you know, my screen. I mean, can you see it? Uh, I'll, I'll see it again. Yeah. No, go on, go on. Sorry. Okay. Let me know if anyone else has a problem. Um, okay. So I was saying this is fully faithful. So I have all of C can be represented in my diagram, which is already a good, a nice thing. But it gets more interesting when we look at the M, the M activity structure. So. If you have string diagrams in a normal monomial category, you expect something like this. So if I have X and Y, this should be, you know, the same as X cross Y. This is, this is what we mean by string diagrams, right? That's just a fundamental property. But here in this case, I'm, I'm not allowed to do that if X and Y are in C, because by the types that I should have mentioned here, I forgot to mention that, the types here are the, the C above and, and below, and that's very important. C above and below. That's important because here there's C above and there's M below, but this should be C above for Y, so I'm not allowed to draw this in my category. This is not allowed. However, if this is in M, then there's M above, M below, and if this is in C, then that's allowed. So the only thing I'm allowed to do is to tensor elements of M with elements of C, with maximum one element of C. And that's exactly what the action gives me, right? Because, you know, if, if, if I have a manual action, I can, you know, I can apply a bunch of actions on X, but there's, on, there's maximum one X. And that, that's what the calculus gives me. Now I have something that looks like string diagrams, except this is bias. I can only, you know, tensor M stuff on top of one C, C thing. Um, to make it clearer, I often, and draw little triangles for the M wires. So the idea is that you have one wire in C with the normal arrow, and then as many wires with triangles as you want. Um, and this is, let me check the time. This is good. Um, and this is quite powerful because in, in, in many contexts, we don't have a full monodal structure. We only have something that looks like an action. Um, a good example is classic categories, and I'm not going to go into detail because um, I don't have enough time left. But the idea is that if C is monoidal and T is a functor, the classic category is, you know, the, 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 the effect for morphisms, right? Um, but in general, this is monoidal for the, for the, the reason that if, if I have two effect for morphisms and I want to draw them in parallel, 
Well, it's not clear what it means. Is it f first the effect of f and then the effect of g, or is it backwards? And that means I can't have a global category, but I do have an action. And that's, this allows me to have one effectful morphism and some pure morphisms if I want. This is, I have as many pure morphisms in parallel with the, with the effectful one. And that's useful because in many cases we want to draw, you know, some, some data flow thing with you know, effectful thing here, another effectful, and, and that's, that's allowed. Now I can draw those. So this is supposed to be an H. Now I can draw those in this new calculus and that's already quite interesting. Um, but what I want here is to talk about optics. So this is not enough. And the second thing we have in this calculus is that R has a nut joint. So I also have an L, which looks very much like R except flipped. And it also works very much like R except flipped. So I draw it with a arrow to the left and it has the same property. So if I have an X and, and, and a function F and C from X to Y, then this will give me something like that. Everything is flipped. It also works with the active restructure the same way. And I can bend wires downwards and that, that's, that's the other property. So there's a duality here. Note, I cannot bend upwards, that's not allowed. Otherwise I could do loops and that's not in general allowed. And um, they satisfy the snake equations, you can slide stuff around them. So they work like cups and caps, um, as you would expect. And now comes uh, part of the magic, which is where this category is interesting for optics, is that if we try to calculate what this particular wire is, x to the right and y to the left, well, we can calculate, that's profunctor composition. That's what it looks like. So that's the, the tensoring of profunctors, right? And we can expand what they mean. And if you look at this, well, you recognize this is exactly optic. You know, this, if we, we quantify the M, and the axon two things, this is optic. And if you remember the category we're working in is pre-sheaves on optic. And this is exactly the unit embedding, right? It's got, you know, the, the variable here and a, a fixed object, and that's the unit embedding. So, so kind of by magic, um, discover a, a, a nice formulation that, you know, Y actually has a nice diagrammatical uh, notation. And this is uh, what gives everything we want because by, unit, by the unit dilemma, we have a bijection between optics and uh, diagrams of that shape. So if we use our new property, optics are in bijection with diagrams of this shape which means I can draw optics and by, by bijection, I mean fully faithful embedding. Um, and that means I can draw optics in there. And that's exactly what we wanted. So let, let's do that. How do I draw optics? So um, I remember that optics were, you know, those pairs um, here, like, you know, alpha and beta forwards and backwards. And now I can draw them in this new, new snow calculus. So alpha goes from X to M, acting on Y, so that's, you know, that's alpha here. And then beta does the same. I'm gonna draw beta backwards and then I can link the two M's. And I have this shape here, which seems to say something like, well, I can extract an, a Y and, and there's, an, there's an M here that I can't really touch because, you know, it's, it's bended away. And that's exactly what it means. I get optics in this diagrammatical sense. If you want a more concrete idea for lenses, this is what it looks like. I literally have a unique, representation of any, you know, of those get put like set, you know, um, get a set of pairs um, will be drawn like that. So here there's the duplication map that comes from the Cartesian structure and I can draw them like that and I, I can prove things about them. So I can compose them, like I said earlier, this is now a formal diagram that makes sense. Um, a little detail here, which is neat. Um, remember that in the quantification here, the important thing was that we, we hit whatever happened on M didn't change what optic we got. So this was this equation. And if you draw the equation in diagrams, you get this equality. But you, we already knew, so this is on, on, this is an M, right? We already know this equality because as I said, we can slide morphisms around bends, right? So this is a downward bend and we, we can just slide F around and we get this, this equality. So the diagrams faithfully represent this notion that we hide away the, the container thing in the middle. Uh, Guillaume, Guillaume uh, you yeah. have uh, uh, like like two minutes. <laughs> yes, I, I, I am aware. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Okay, and now we have, um, so now I've, I've reached what I wanted, which is we have 
diagrammet diagrams for optics. And this works for lenses, this works for many other things, this probably works for most of the applications of optics I mentioned. Um, and now I can actually show a few things we can do with our calculus, given if I have time. Um, I mentioned the, um, the action structure that works kind of like a model structure and that's useful for classly categories. Um, and I have one other example, which is for lawfulness, and I'm not going to go too much into detail, but the idea is that if you have a lens, you expect some kind of compatibility condition between get and put, right? So if, if you want them to actually refer to the same thing, you expect, for example, that if you put a new Y and then you retrieve it, then, well, maybe you get the original one. So those three laws together are called very well behaviedness and they, they encode a strong notion of compatibility. And it turns out that, I'm, I'm gonna skip the nice, the nice diagrammatic things here, sadly. It turns out that we can draw them equivalently as those two laws, those two equalities that only talk about the lens as a black box. And the reason this is interesting is because um, this actually, this diagram is writable for any optic. And it actually makes sense, not only makes sense, but is the right notion in many cases of some notion of lawfulness. And in this case, it means, you know, doing it twice is the same as doing it once, essentially. So there's a strong compatibility. Now we can draw that. Um, I'm not going to go into any other examples unless someone asks questions. So I'm going to conclude there. Um, just to sum up, we've seen what optics were, we've seen um, that you know, they're used in many things. And I've shown neatly that surprisingly, appreciations on optics happen to have um, this very nice structure to them. And there's a lot more things we can do in them. If, you, if you've heard about profunctor optics, we can do that in these diagrams. We can talk about trace categories as well. So there's many things to explore here. I'm quite, I quite like this, um, the surprising structures that's been uncovered there. So, um, yep, yeah, that's it. Thank you very much. Interesting. Thank you, thank you. This, this is really nice. Um, so I think that uh, Tom has asked some questions. Uh, in, can I can I see the questions? Um, may, maybe may, maybe he can speak. That would be. Easy. Yes, I can. But am I the only one in the room? Yeah, I know. But you you you're the one who asks questions. <laughs> okay. <laughs> it's weird. Okay, uh, so the first question was uh, about forbidding several C wires in parallel. I was wondering whether you could uh, allow them and pass them as first a, a tensor, which has a higher priority than the action. Well, the problem is C, I mean, the only structure that C has is this action. Wait, let me. Uh, it's not even monoidal. No, it's not even monoidal. That's the thing. I only okay. require this. So, this, it, I can't even make sense of, of what you propose in the general case. And that's part of why it's interesting. Okay. When C is actually monoidal, then in some cases, indeed, you can allow multiple C wires to be in, parallel in a way that makes sense. Okay. And the second question was uh, whether you could uh, get the geometry of interaction as a particular instance. Um, the answer is I don't know because there's links with those kind of things and um, there's links with comms, there's some links with um, dialogues, um, but I'm not familiar enough. I, 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 know it's an, I know it's a possibility, but I haven't explored um, geometry of interaction so, too much. Um, I suspect that the answer is yes. I suspect there's a strong link here. But I'm not quite sure yet. Okay, thanks. Okay, so would anyone like to ask a question? I can't see anyone. Uh, yeah, okay, Lionel Vo is saying something. So let me check if I can see him. Yes. So Lionel. Yeah. Yes. Uh, well, that's just a, fol a follow up on uh, Tom's question. Uh, can you make sense of the int construction in this setting? Yes. One? Yeah. I can. And it's actually quite nice. Um, so if, if you look at what the type of a trace is, 
Um, it turns out that it's something that has this type. It's a box from, let me get it right. It's it, a trace will be something like that. And in fact, I can draw it in, in as an upward bend in this um, TAM category. And that allows me to get a lot of diagrams that, you know, that makes sense with the trace. And in particular, I can have the, the end construction as a sub, a sub, actually a full subcategory, no, not full, the, the subcategory um, of Tambara modules in that way, using the trace and I can, I can define um, the int morphisms in there. So it is actually, yeah, a lot of things happening with int in there. Okay, so, so maybe there is a way to, to, to deal with the GUI. Wait, that, that's why, so yeah, the, that's the why I suspect point. GUI. Yeah. But, Thanks. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure enough what it is to, to, to be confident. Yeah. All right, just, just to mention, for me, it was just the in construction. Oh, are they the same thing? <laughs> so, 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 yeah. <laughs> well, in, in which case, the answer is, is a resounding yes. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> Good. Maybe it's just me. Okay, so thanks. I think, I think uh, we have to move on. So, so thank, thank, thanks a lot. Guillaume, 